Okay, uh, so there's an exam in a week. Um, I hope you show up because if you don't show up to an exam, that's really bad for your grade. Um, I hope you're on time, but I think that only applies to the people who are not here yet. Um, and I mean, so I put a lot of problems. I, basically, I told you, you can do a thousand problems in the book if you want to review. And at the end, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to give you problems similar to those. So. And, and you're free to ask me any questions about any problem you want. And, and they, they don't even have to be in the review, just any problem you run into. Okay. So we are going to talk about um, integral domains. Oh, and I decided the exam. So this is not in, in this exam anymore. Welcome. This is not in this exam anymore. Uh, the exam is only up to fields of fractions. So you have time to study it. <clears throat> okay. So um, Monday, I reminded you what a unit is. It's an invertible element in a ring. I said two things are associates if they're the same up to multiply my unit, like an, an, a whole number and its opposite, or like two polynomials that differ by multiplication by a constant. And I also define irreducible and prime. So reducible means you can't reduce it. Every time you write it as a product, uh, one of the one of the things you're multiplying is invertible, and the other must be its associate. So five is negative one times negative five, but that's not really factoring it. It's just a very trivial way of factoring it. <clears throat> and we say something is prime if whenever it divides a product, it divides one of the factors. Um, okay. So I was halfway through telling you that irreducible is not the same as prime. And I took this ring as example, the integers together with the square root of negative three, which are a subring of the complex numbers. And we show that two is irreducible. It cannot be factored in, in this ring, but it is not prime. <clears throat> Why is it not, not prime? Uh, well, two divided four. That's, I'm sure of that. Uh, and four is the product of one plus root negative three and one minus root negative three. <clears throat> uh, but two doesn't divide either of these factors. Because if I multiply two by any of these numbers, I get a combination of one and root three with uh, even coefficients, of course. Um, so I'm never gonna, just nothing times two, unless I, I use fractions. Uh, nothing times two is gonna be one plus root negative three. So two divides uh, four, but it doesn't divide any of its factors if I factor it this way. So you could be reducible and be not prime. Uh, that's, you know, that's a problem if you hope to factor things into reducibles uniquely because clearly, I mean, four is two times two, but it's also this product and there's just no way around that. <clears throat> Any question? Okay. So 
you could be irreducible and not be prime, but you, if you're prime, you have to be irreducible. Um, if I have a prime element in a ring, how can I show that it's irreducible? So that it doesn't have any roots. What are the roots of an element in a ring? If I have the number five in the integers, what are the roots of five? One in five. Okay, those are the factors. I don't, uh, roots, I, I think polynomials have roots and maybe Functions have roots if they vanish, but rings don't don't come with roots. And and also, if even if if you had a polynomial, it wouldn't a polynomial can have no roots and still be reducible. Like like this polynomial over the reals has no roots. Um, but it's a square. It's it's reducible. So by the definition of irreducible, what am I supposed to show? That there's two numbers that multiply to make it? That there's two numbers or, or that there's no two numbers? That there's no two numbers that can. Okay. Uh, okay. So, how do we show that that's impossible? <clears throat> now I need to use the hypothesis that A is prime. By definition, if it's prime, the only two numbers that make it is one and itself. No, that is a no. That is not the definition of prime in a ring. That's the definition of prime for a whole number. For for whole numbers, for integers, you know, we already know that reducibles and primes are the same thing. They're just the prime numbers. But this is an element of a of a ring. This could be, you know, it could be an element in this ring. Um. Uh, or in a polynomial ring, or just any any random ring you can think of, uh, and and there, I'm telling you, a prime is not something whose only factors are one and itself. Also, a prime, even an integer prime, has negative one as a factor. I'm telling you, a prime is something that whenever it divides a product, it divides one of the factors. So that's what I'm saying when I say that A is a prime. For example, two, I mean, this example two had no factors that were non trivial, but it's not a prime. So, like in your, in the very bottom, you, so you have to say then A divides B or A divides C, just like you've written on the top left. Right, because if A equals B or C, a number, uh, any, any, anything divides itself, right? So, 
um, if so so what does this mean say that a divides b since a and b are interchangeable So then do you want to show that C is just some unit? We, yeah, that's what we want to show. Uh, how do we show that? So I have that A is B times C, but also that A divides B. Why would that mean that C is a unit? What if I write does that mean B equals A D? Yeah, that's yeah, that's exactly what I was gonna write. So okay, so if B equals A times C and A equals B times C, what do I do with these two equations? Substitute one where B into A equals B to C. Uh, sure, I can do that. B is B times C times D. So, so what does this mean now? I'm almost there. So then one is equal to C D, and you know that um, that D is is like some um, some integer since A divides B and B is A D. So then C has to be um, a unit. I don't know. D I mean D is not an integer, D is an element in the ring, but you're right, it's a unit. Um, because because I found you found the inverse. Uh, okay. Um, so well, why can I why can I cross out B? Is that something you can do with any ring? Cancel something in a multiplication. You can only do that if it has an inverse, right? Uh, so, well, no, I, I can do that in more situations. For example, in the integers, you know, if I know that 3a equals 3b, I know a equals b, but 3 doesn't have an inverse in the integers. b probably has no inverse. Okay, so I have B equals B C D and then I'm saying this is zero. And then I'm saying that 
And I'm saying that this means that one minus CV is zero. Um, why does this work? It's an, is this an integral domain? So, right, exactly. It's because it's an integral domain. Integral domains are exactly the rings where you can cancel. Uh, well, you can cancel element uh, multiplication by things that are not zero. <clears throat> Otherwise. Um, you probably you probably can't. <clears throat> okay, so every prime is irreducible. Any questions? Okay, I should say. Like this example, being irreducible depends on the ring. So, for example, two, like we said, is irreducible. In here, but three is not um, because it's a product of two things which are not uh, invertible. So um, you take the primes in the integers and, and you see them inside of a bigger ring and sometimes they're primes, sometimes they're not. Um, and it's a, it's a very interesting question to see um, to see when they stay prime. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's move on. So I think the next thing is okay. So. Uh, so this is an example of a ring that is um, very, pretty bad in, a, in the sense that we can't factor things uniquely. Um, so I'm gonna, we're, we're just gonna give a name to the rings where we, we can factor things uniquely. And those are called unique factorization domains. So uh, this is a definition. An integral domain R is a unique factorization domain uh, and this is a terribly long word, so we just say UFD. Um, if two things happen, well, the two things are that I can factor anything and that the factorization is unique. So the first condition is that um, you can factor any element in the ring. Should I say non-unit, I guess. If it's a unit, it's really the vectorization is empty. Like, how do you factor the number one to primes? I would say it's just itself. 
Um, and so that's the factorization part. The unique part is saying that um, any two factorizations, so if I have a bunch of irreducibles, And they they factor the same elements in the ring. Uh, well, then these factorizations are are the same. Um, so what can I mean? What's the only thing that cannot be the same? Um, the order could be different. By right? you, if you factor a number into primes they could um you could always switch up the order or you could write negative signs uh, but that's um that's all you could really do to mess with the uniqueness so there's the same number of irreducibles on on both sides and So, for example, think of the whole numbers. Um, a prime um, is really up to for all we care is the same as its opposite three and negative three. We don't care. We don't care which we get in a factorization. So what I'm saying is that you have two factorizations. You switch them. You switch the order around, and and you multiply with some units like negative one, and then you should get the same factorization. Um, remember that being associate means um, that one, that it's what you get uh, multiplying by a unit. Okay, so this is a unique factorization domain. Any questions? I... Yeah. You go back a second. When you say n equals m, is that an and afterwards? Yeah. So if there's two factorizations, they have to be the same length, and also they have to have the same element. Oh no, I meant sorry. Uh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Here. And. Right. Um, so what do I mean by some reordering? Um, I could I could write the same number like this, or or like this, but you wouldn't say that because these two factorizations are the same are different you you wouldn't say that they're different um right um Um, okay, so so I guess the, the main example is that C is a unique factorization domain. This is called the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, that every number can be factored into primes in a unique way. And likewise, 
in what I guess is now our go-to example. These are factorizations into reducibles. Um, that are not equal up to reordering. So this ring is not a U of D. So what's another example of a, of a U of D? Oh, sorry to keep asking questions, but oh, no, go, go, how, go for it. Are you saying that three, five, Three times five times seven times three is equal is equal to that? Oh no. Now they are. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, you will get a bonus point for that if you hadn't gotten one already. Uh, okay, but if you you know if you can do simple math like apparently I can't, you you can write two factorizations that look different, but they're not because just put them in order. Okay, any other questions? Thank you for that, Roy. So what's another example of a unique factorization domain? We don't know that many rings, so. What is another ring where you can factor everything into irreducibles in a unique way. Okay, uh, what is another example of an integral domain? Integers. Integers, well, not, that's not another one. I have, this is the, the only one. I, I have two in this page. I'm sorry. <laughs> Can you do the integers modulo a prime? Integers modulo a prime. Um, so is this, so let's see, is this a, a unique factorization domain? Thank you, John. Did you get a bonus point yet? Yeah, I got one. All right. <clears throat> So, um, so can we take any number in, say, Z mod three and factor it uh, uniquely into reducibles, um, unless it's a unit, and in which case we don't need to factor anything.
This is a yes or no question, so you can take a guess. Will Z modulo P every number uh, less than that prime won't be, um, well, its factors will be, it, how, how do you say this? Um, trivial, I guess, it's just one times the number itself, right? Uh huh. I think of course, P itself is just, well, P, P is just zero. To pull on to zero, yeah. Right, so, um, yeah, so there's nothing to factor in, in Z mod P because everything is invertible. Um, every field is a U of D. Because there's nothing to factor. And and units, I would say units are already factored as they are, you know. Um, so okay, so what's an example? So what's a what's a, um, an integral domain that's not a field? Okay, I'm gonna give you a big hint. Um, you have a whole exam next week on on these rays. There's a title of a chapter in the book. Polynomial rings. Polynomial rings. Thank you, John. Right. Um, Polynomial rings, so polynomial rings turn out to be U of these um, if K is a field. Uh, we, I mean, we almost, we've almost done all the work to prove this, but um, we're about to, we're about to show it. Okay. Um, Okay, so that's another example of a, of a U of D. Um, I think probably you can believe that every polynomial factors into irreducibles in a unique way up to multiplication by constants. Okay. Uh, all right, so um, our goal. Um, for I think the whole of this chapter is to find a lot of U of these and prove that they are U of these. So um, just gonna show ways you can do that. So that leads me to define another type of ring, which I've already, I guess I've already defined, but let me do it again, uh, which are principal ideal domains. So um, let me tell you what that is. Uh, that domain is a principal ideal domain. Uh, if every ideal is principal. Um, so every ideal is just the set of multiples of one element. This is um, okay. Um, so again, okay, this is a 
very long word again. So we just say PID. So we have two, two acronyms so far, PID and UFT. Um, so, um, so what are examples of principal ideal domains? Um, well, Z is a principal ideal domain. I, I hope you've done this problem last semester, finding all the ideals in, in Z, all the ideals in Z are the multiples of some integer. Um, if K is a field, uh, polynomials over it are a PID. Uh, this we showed last chapter using the division algorithm. Um, actually, for both of these, you use the division algorithm. Um, so um, I think, so can you tell me an example of a ring that's not a PID? I feel like this was in your homework. Or maybe not. <clears throat> this has come up in class for sure. Z of uh, square root of negative three. Uh huh. Well, uh, that is that is correct. Uh, that is not a PID. So, what's an ideal? What's an ideal here that's not principal? Oh, well, this is tricky. This is this is a, a hard question. Um, so the ideal, let me just tell you the answer. Uh, the ideal generated by two and one plus root negative three is not principal. So this is everything of this form. That's what ideal generation means. The reason basically um, is that two and one plus root negative three have no common divisor other than a unit. But the ideal, the ideal is not um, is not generated by a unit. For example, one is not in this ideal. Okay, um, so here's an easier example. Just a polynomial ring in more than one variable. The ideal generated by the variables is not principal. Uh, there's no, again, because there's no common factor to X and Y, and this ideal is not everything. One is not in this ideal. Uh, this was in, I, I already did this uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, another example is polynomial ring over the integers. Uh, again, this ideal generated by two and X 
it doesn't contain one. One is not a linear combination of two of an even numbers and polynomials that have there are multiples of x. Uh, but again, one is the greatest common divisor of two and x. <clears throat> I guess you can do this yourselves. Okay, so a lot of um, um, so I think we know a lot of rings that are PIDs. We know a lot, a lot of rings that aren't. Um, so this is a U of D. We've said this is a U of D, and these we're going to show this chapter that these are U of Ds. you can do unique factorization in all of them. Uh, here, this one is not a U of D. As you know, we've been talking about that all day. So it seems that, um, it seems that without being a principal ideal domain, you can still have unique factorization, but we don't know any example where you have where you're a principal ideal domain and you're not a U of D. And that's because there's no such example. So uh, hopefully on Friday or Monday, coming up, every PID is a U of D. <clears throat> so one way to show that uh, bring into a unique factorization domain is showing that it's a PID. And that, for example, shows that the polynomial ring over a field is a U of D because we've already shown that it's a principal ideal domain. Uh, so that's what we're going to show. Um, so actually, the proof, most of the proof is very similar to, to what we did with um, polynomial rings. So uh, here's one thing we're going to show, which we showed for polynomial rings. Maybe we showed for all rings. Anyway, um, Let's look at what happens with principal ideals. When do they contain each other? Um, I've done this. I mean, I feel like I've done this for polynomial rings and, and you're gonna see the proof is exactly the same. So um, elements divide each other if and only if the, the principal ideals contain each other and they're associated differently if they generate the same ideal. Say one, two, three. And you an element is a unit if and only if um, it generates the whole ring with an ideal. Okay, this is a very simple proposition. So uh, let's just do it again. If we've, hopefully you remember how this goes. Suppose that something divides something else. Uh, then um, what does this mean by definition? There's another element such that B equals A times that element. Okay. Um, so, um, what does this mean? This means that B is in the set of multiples of, of A. Okay. 
just very similar thing to saying, right? B is a multiple of A, if and only if B is in the set of multiples of A. But the set of multiples of A is the ideal generated by A. And now, if you have an element, if you have B containing an ideal, everything B generates is going to be in that ideal as well. This is because um, the ideal B generates is the smallest ideal. <clears throat> so the ideal generated by B is the smallest ideal containing B. So if B is containing some ideal, such as the ideal generated by A, then it's going to be at least as big as the smallest one, which means that the smallest one is contained in, in the ideal generated by A. And, and this proof, the implications go both ways. If, if this ideal, if these two ideals are containing each other, that means that just an element of, of the ideal, such as B, is containing the ideal generated by A. And by definition, that means B is one of the multiples of A. So I can write it like this or like that. And that's it. All right. Now, this one is even easier. A and B are associates. Uh, this means by definition that there's a unit such, such that one is a multiple of uh, one by the unit is the other. So this means, uh, well, let me, I, I don't know what even to ask you here. If I can write if I can write this equation, this means that B divides A. And if I can write the other equation, this means that A divides B. And now by part one, this means that one ideal contains uh, the other. Well, that they're both containing each other. So how can two sets be containing each other if they're the same? So another way to think about of associates is as um, elements that generate the same ideal. And finally, being a unit means that there's something else. Uh, so it means that you can write a pro, uh, you can factor one as a product of a by something else. Uh, and I could say that this means that A divides one. And A divides one again by part one means that the ideal one, which is the whole ring, is contained in the ideal generated by A. And this would mean if everything is contained in the ideal. Well, that, that means the ideal is everything. Right, any questions? <sighs> okay, well, uh, then, well, you can stick around and ask a question. <clears throat> <clears throat> 